Before I begin with an acknowledgement, let me say I was instructed by the university officials to rather use this podium. It's not out of fear of anything. At least we sit here. <laughs> <laughs> Program director, Mr. Peter Ndoro, and the chair of the museum council, uh, Mr. Important Mkize, Dr. Albertina Lutuli and Mrs. Jane Wabaza, and the rest of the Lutuli family, Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Kozulu Natal, Professor Albert Mari. I dare not forget my dear wife, Mapefo. The Director General of the Department of Arts and Culture, Mr. Vusimu Simkize, Chairperson of the Lutuli Foundation, Mr. Ntunzi Lutuli, the Lutuli Museum Members of Council, members of the UKZN Council, members of the Executive Management, UKZN, deans, academics and staff, students, alumni, captains of industry, members of the Groundville community, members of the media, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all. Maybe just to veer off the script first and say, as Dr. Albertino Lutuli was speaking, I was reminded of the profound inspiration that Chief Albert Lutuli was to me during the formative years of my political life as a student at the University of Zululand. At times we used a route that allowed us to pass by his residence. And students would shout and say, that is Chief Albert Lutuli's residence. Something would simply be fired up into my spirit. I wouldn't make sense of it. And subsequently, I got hold of his book while I was still a student, Let My People Go. I just don't know how many of us really appreciate the profundity of the, of the, of the topic alone, the heading alone, Let My People Go. And the perspective from which this man of God was coming because it's fundamentally about the story of the children of Israel who experienced a lot of persecution and suffering at the time in Egypt and the continued struggle for freedom that they embarked upon and a message kept on being sent to their captors to say let my people go. And of critical importance before I even read out my message is this. That when they left, it was not just the equivalent of political freedom, the possibility to vote, to vote your leaders into office. Because that is always inadequate freedom. They left with treasure. There was credible economic empowerment that went along with their freedom. So we dare not assume that we are free as African people throughout the continent of Africa as long as all we have is the possibility to elect into office those that we prefer. Because strictly speaking, you would rather have abundance of food and land and the necessary technical know-how how to or on working on the land to be wealthy, to be productive, and be of help to the less privileged than simply have the right to vote. So that must be remembered. made to understand that the objective of the Chief Albert Lutuli Memorial Lecture is to promote the principles and values that he stood for and upheld like peace, human rights, justice, and the harmonious coexistence of people regardless of race, color, and creed. 
And the theme of this year, as uh, the program director has informed us, is all about the challenges that face the African continent, especially the ownership of land and its use. Some reflections on what is to be done to secure a future where peace and shared prosperity will reign in the African continent is what I was called upon to do. We all know that Chief Albert Lutuli was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize because of his unwavering commitment to the resolution of challenges, however taxing, frustrating, or frustrating by peaceful means. To address challenges relating to land use and land ownership in Africa, the solutions we propose in his memory must be inclusive, geared at securing enduring peace, stability, and shared prosperity. But our starting point in that journey ought to be a connection with the views on land and the relationship between landlessness and poverty and homelessness. Chivalbert Lutuli said, and I quote, these rights could and should be extended to all people in an integrated society for each to use voluntarily according to his inclination and capabilities. Apartheid in the reserves will not give the people more land, and yet scarcity of land is one of the paramount needs, close quote. African people need more land, needed more land back in the 50s already, and land was one of their paramount needs. That was 50 years ago. Where are we in South Africa and elsewhere in the African continent? It is a matter that should not be romanticized. It is a matter that must be addressed frontally, but without dividing the South African nation. Good people, we've been divided for far too long. And much of the suffering that we have been experiencing and continue to experience is because we lay more emphasis on what divides us than seek to focus on the many things we share in common, zoom in on them with a view to channeling our energies and collective wisdom towards finding a solution that can unite us, reconcile us, so that we can march forward to, a shared, uh, to shared prosperity. The Nobel laureate also said, open codes, you will agree that the masses of the African people live in abject poverty in both rural and urban areas, and so many Africans find themselves landless and homeless, close quote. Highlighting the need to soldier on until this inhuman treatment of the African people in their ancestral land is reversed, Chief Albert Lutuli observed, open quotes, since UNEP, we have witnessed and dis a decided deterioration in making available to African people opportunities for full development. Must we fold our hands in despair when we see our people drift to ultimate impotence and perpetual slavery? God forbid that we should be so untrue to Africa and the cause of freedom, close quote. Chivalbert Lutuli's philosophy of freedom, land ownership, and poverty eradication transcended the borders of South Africa. It was truly Pan-Africanist in character. It is therefore not surprising that the theme for this year is geared at securing lasting solutions in relation to land ownership and land use for the entire African continent. Modern day South Africans should similarly be consumed by the desire to land solutions for the entire African continent. This is so for at least two interrelated reasons. In the preamble to our constitution, we pray, typical of the spirit of the man of God, Chief Albert Lutuli, open quotes, Nkosi Sikelela i Africa. Mutzimu Tatuzeza. Africa, Rosi Katekisa Africa. We also sing Nkosi Sikelele Africa in our national anthem. So it has always been and should always be about the entire African continent. 
We have thus committed ourselves to the well-being of the African continent. It is therefore fitting that we pour our energies and collective wisdom in endeavors that would result in sensible, humane, and just land ownership patterns, sustainable and beneficial land use by all, shared prosperity and enduring peace. The major challenge that confronted almost all African countries is the land issue. In fact, one would not be exaggerating to say that the land issue was prim <laughs> that the struggle was primarily about the dispossession of African people of their land. Gross injustices took place in relation to the land issue. As Chief uh, Albert Lutuli put it, open quotes, one cannot separate the issue of race from the argument about ownership at present. Because one race insists on exclusive ownership, close quote. He went on to say, open quotes, with the exception of a small number of voices crying in the wilderness, the overwhelming majority of whites reply that South Africa is exclusively owned by three million whites. It does not stop either with ownership of land and wealth and participation in government. In this view, whites, because they are whites, extend their possession of ownership of the remaining 11 million people who are expected to regard themselves as fortunate to be allowed to live and breathe and work in a white man's country, close quote. This position obtained in virtually all African countries. As a result, land and wealth ownership in Africa is overwhelmingly in the hands of our former colonizers or their descendants. This would explain why genuine peace talk less of shared prosperity is hard to come by in Africa. The natives of Africa are largely landless, poor, marginalized, ignored, and at times even despised by those whose ancestry through unjust and indefensible, indefensible means acquired their land. In honor of the memory of Inkosi Albert Lutuli, we must resolve this historic challenge, this monumental injustice, this abuse of the fundamental in human rights of the African people. Mr. Lauren Cunningham first gave a moving description of the breathtaking beauty of the African landscape, rivers, lakes, animals, mountains, waterfalls, and then said, open quote. Our great artist God has displayed these and other wonders in Africa. What are his plans for this continent and this people? He hid more gold here, more diamonds, plutonium, and copper than in any other place on earth. Africa has enough arable land to feed a large portion of the earth. The continent has more hydroelectric potential than all the rest of the world put together, as well as abundance of coal and oil. Wisely used by and for Africans, the continent's resources co could contribute significantly to new health and prosperity, unfortunately. For too long, Africa's people have been enslaved, raped, abused, dismissed by prejudice, hatred, or just ignored. Their rich resources have often been collected and used by others, even stolen, with little, if any, benefit going to the Africans. Instead, their value has attracted foreign exploitations, enriching dictators and warlords, bringing bloodshed, starvation, and even modern forms of black-on-black -black slavery." Close quote. Within an African context, it then makes a lot of sense to conclude that land ownership accompanied by properly guided and funded diligent usage equals wealth ownership. Africa is rich in minerals, fertile soil, rivers with abundant water, a wide variety of much needed, of much treasured game, 
vast tracts of land and unrivaled, unrivaled electricity generating potential. How then are we to resolve the ownership and utilization of land? Ngozi Albert Lutuli was convinced about the potency of peaceful means as a weapon to resolve challenges that appear to be intractable. African people must wake up to the reality that the objectives the likes of Chief Albert Lutuli struggled and died pursuing are far from being realized. Some of the peaceful strategies effectively employed to wage the liberation struggle should not have been abandoned when the right to vote and occupy high government positions was realized. An earnest pursuit of the peaceful resolution of the land and economic issues should have been embarked upon. Concomitantly, there must now begin to be a, wild, a worldwide united campaign to conscientize the global community about the injustice and devastating effect of the landlessness and virtual exclusion of the African people from meaningful participation in the mainstream of, economy, of economies in Africa. The exploitation, collection, and exclusive enjoyment of Africa's wealth by all but Africans must also be campaigned against. The free Nelson Mandela campaign and other similar advocacies must be seriously pursued until it becomes apparent that poverty eradication, restoration of good health and longevity, peace, stability, sustainable economic development and growth in Africa, and shared prosperity will never materialize as long as the economic injustice, the economic justice-oriented fundamentals uh, are not put in place. War is not an option. Strategies that militate against peace and stability are also not an option. But silence and inaction in the face of life-threatening and dehumanizing migration, abject poverty and landlessness are also not an option. As Chief Albert Lutuli would have done, African people must pursue meaningful, purposeful, and truly intentional dialogue with those who own land and the sworn defenders of the status quo internally and or oh, internal and global campaigns must also be waged concertedly and tirelessly until normalcy is returned to. Let me pause here and make some remarks. You know, I have observed that there are some of us who are traversing the globe seeking to conscientize the global community about why it is supposed to be good and acceptable that the status quo in relation to land ownership and the ownership of the wealth of South Africa ought to be maintained. But here lies the question. Where are the victims of landlessness and, exclus and exclusion from meaningful participation in the mainstream economy? Where is their voice? As I said, war is not an option. Finger pointing is also not an option. I've spent quite a bit of time engaging with African people and our white compatriots about the critical challenges that confront this nation, and that is the land, racism, and exclusion from meaningful participation in the economy. Initially, there was resistance, but as soon as you demonstrate, and people can easily connect with a genuine heart, as soon as you demonstrate convincingly that as a matter of fact, it's for the go common good of all of us that we vigorously pursue enduring peace and stability founded on the truth in order to resolve the land issue, the economic issue, and the race issue. People's eyes then begin to open up and they warm up to the possibility of jointly pursuing and finding a solution. Let me make my point. 
I don't think I was the only one who thought that the release or proposed release of Nelson Mandela and other freedom fighters by President Hitler was a ruse. I think there were many others who thought it's a lie. He wants them in so that they can destroy them while they have lowered their guard. And when the right-wingers invaded the venue where negotiations were held, I said, I knew it, and I don't think I was the only one. When We Patong happened, and when Chris Hani was, was, was assassinated, I said, that's it. When President Nelson Mandela and President Hitler squared up, at the venue of the negotiations, critical to our peaceful future. I said, that's it too. As a Nigerian, we said, that's it too. <laughs> so I gave up, and I don't think I was the only one. Lo and behold, we underestimated the resilience of black and white South Africans in pursuit of a just cause. We underestimated the potency of the philosophy of Chief Albert Lutuli, that ineffective, harmless, as a peaceful campaign might appear to be, it actually is the only recipe for enduring peace, stability, and shared prosperity. The difficulty has been we have for far too long been tap dancing around the truth. We didn't want to rock the boat. It is about time that we appreciate the principles that drove Chief Albert Lutu. Tell the truth however painful it may be. But, but it's not forever. It will eat you for now, and the itching will disappear after a while. Don't mislead one another. I'm open to my white competitors because I love them, genuinely, whether they believe it or not. But I'm not going to say to them that there is no racism in South Africa. There is. Otherwise, the previously excluded from the mainstream economy would, after 24 years, be captains of industries in their, many, in their numbers. Why is it? Why is it that young white compatriots who, at the dawn of democracy, were not big players in the economy, now they are big players, and seasoned economists or entrepreneurs who were previously excluded are still out there in the cold. There is subconscious racism that keeps them out, and we've got to confront that. We need intellectuals to pour out they are intellectual gifts with a view to finding a solution to this challenge, both black and white. You see, let it not be us and them. There are many genuine white people out there, many. There are many committed uh, black people out there, not those who are just looking for making a lot of money, because some black people are not committed to the plight of the poor. All they are interested in is how to make more money that is why Africa is not moving. Everybody knows all the right-sounding noises to make for the sake of getting support from the people. When in fact they are just fooling them. Let them occupy that office. It's all about them. It's all about their hidden masters or handlers. Nothing about the public. So it's time for us to get real confront and tell the truth without being hostile to any section of the South African population. So 
I'm, I've, I've gone out of the reading now. Let me just speak. You know, I have many times over in this country been asked by black people and white people separately or together to come and address them on anything concerning land ownership, participation in the economy, racism, ethical leadership, unity and reconciliation. But there is a particularly striking meeting that took place in Paris, I think it was on the 30th of August or something. I was asked by the South African Brahman Farmers Society to come and address them. It was taxing because I had just been uh, to Cape Town to address the one meeting. I had to fly to Johannesburg, immediately jump into a car and go to Paris. There were about a thousand farmers there. But before I could speak, there was a white brother from Namibia, Mr. Rhino van der Merve. He is the president of the Brahman Farmers Association in Namibia. So he spoke just before me. And this is what he said. He said, my, I'm paraphrasing, but that's, the essence is there. He said, my white brothers, let me tell you. We became landowners because injustice made it possible for us to be landowners. He said, you know that we did not come with land here. It is the people were generous to accommodate us and we were not happy with the little, with, with what they had given us. We wanted to take all, even what was in their possession. Now that we live in a democratic order, the time has come for us to sacrifice. He said, if we are not willing to sacrifice in order to address both the land and the economic issue, there will never be peace because it is unjust to, com to continue that way. Oh, Rhino had opened the door for me. <laughs> and happily, uh, typical of the Chief Albert Lutuli's uh, spirit, they opened the meeting with prayer. So I drew a Bible verse to lay the foundation about loving God and loving your brother or sister as you love yourself. Meaning, if you think it is good for you to have a farm, reflect on why your other uh, brothers and sisters who happen to be black don't have farms. What happened? Is it just and sustainable for the indigents of the land to continue to be landless to continue to be poor and actually die of poverty, to be exclusively associated with gardening and working in the house, to be exclusively associated with having shacks as their accommodation. Let's stop tap dancing around the truth. Many people don't like the truth. And they attack me for that. Do you think I care? So, let's connect with reality. And the reality is, land was taken from African people. We've got, just as we were able to solve the apartheid governance out of existence through a negotiated process, I'm confident, considering the hurdles that we had to pass through as a nation, black and white, that if we really commit ourselves to addressing this issue, we will. We are a gifted people. We are wise people. Look at our country. There are very few countries that can compare to South Africa. We are smart people. We are generous people. We are kind people. But we have allowed ourselves to be dragged this or the other way. What a pity that we too have fallen victim of what researchers have discovered, which is 87% of the people just accept as gospel truth anything that is posted either in a social media platform, in the newspaper, or anything of the sort. Whether it is true or not, 
there is no effort to check whether this is true or a lie. If they say Mohueng has robbed a bank, they say, oh, we didn't know he's a criminal. <laughs> no research, nothing. <laughs> Let us stop outsourcing our thinking and analytical responsibilities. Let us think things through. You are the leaders that this nation and posterity needs to address the challenges that confront this nation. What a shame it will be when your great-grandchildren wake up to realize that once upon a time there was Chief Albert Lutuli who sacrificed all, including the convenience of his family, who was killed under mysterious circumstances. Even now, we don't know what killed him. So that you and I can become chief justice, professors, deputy vice chancellor, director general, captain of industry. And once we got to that point, we said, oh, it's Uhuru now. The struggle is over. Even when you are confronted by the reality of abject poverty, on a daily basis, you wouldn't care less. Yours is all about self-preservation. All you do is to check, okay, does the media like people who tell the truth? Or must I just say, uh, Gupta, and then I'll be covered? <laughs> Will they cover me even when I confront the realities, the painful realities of a South African and African society. Forget about media coverage. We are not here for the media. If they cover you, it is okay. If they don't want to cover you, it is the hearts and the minds that you must reach out to. One person, just one person, like Mother Teresa or Martin Luther King, in whom you plant a good seed, will spread that good message. Before you know it, the whole nation, the whole continent, is focused on what matters the most. How else did the liberation struggle survive? Did they own media houses? Did they have Twitter? Did they have Facebook? It was one person talking to another and the message spread in that fashion before we knew it. You had your black consciousness movement with the advent of the banning of the major liberation organizations. You had trade union movements. You had UDF, you had all sorts of organizations that fought for the freedom that we are now basking on as if there is no tomorrow. Now, to achieve all of the above requires selfless and truly and true servant leadership that is not imprisoned by greed and a never satisfied appetite for money and material possessions. Smooth modern day dictators who pretend to care about the people when it is really themselves that they serve must be seen through and rejected. That way, workable solutions to land ownership and mutually beneficial and sustainable land use, as well as shared prosperity would become reali a realizable dream. Tangible evidence would back, will begin to emerge, but only if you have a Lutuli type of leadership style in Africa. Let us each play our part in our own circles of influence, pursuing national unity and reconciliation without sacrificing the urgent need to take African people out of landlessness, homelessness, sickness, and abject poverty. Properly contextualized, we ought to sacrificially say, as Chief Lutuli did, open quote, this stand of mine, which resulted in my being sacked from the chieftainship, might seem foolish and disappointing to some liberal and moderate Europeans and non-Europeans with whom I have worked these many years and with whom I still hope to work. This is no parting of ways, but a launching farther into the deep. That's a, spiritual, a deep spiritual revelation. 
I invite them to join us in our unequivocal pronouncement of all legitimate African aspirations and in our firm stand against injustice and oppression close code. Investors must be made to honor their social responsibility contracts. Never again must the African soil and its resources be exploited with the connivance of greedy African leaders who occupy positions of responsibility in return only for a few classrooms and boreholes. A genuine win-win investment is what Africa needs and deserves in return for the exploitation of its minerals, other natural resources, and labor force. The positive and tangible impact of investment on the lives of our people is what we must all insist on. There must be transparency on the terms and conditions of investment, and they must be openly published or reported on, particularly in relation to how investments plow back into the land owned in rural communities or the state. Tax evasion, harmful and predatory business practices must be fought most vigorously to end both public and private sector corruption. Our environment is our future. The African forestry and the big five, especially rhinos and elephants, have been targeted by greed. Our rivers have been polluted to the detriment of our health and future in the name of job creation and economic growth. Look at climate change or climate warming that have given birth to things we could never have thought of like Hurricane Michael. Enough is enough. Injustice is unsustainable. And in recognition of this reality, our pursuit of peace and justice must not be grounded on a false or shaky foundation. We must first internalize the truth outlined in the preamble to our Constitution and the aspiration we have all committed ourselves to to realize these objectives. The quality of life of all citizens and the potential of each person, I beg your pardon, the quality of all citizens must be improved and the potential of each person must be freed by the envisaged land ownership patterns and the transparent and responsible manner in which we allow it to be used. Greed and heartless disregard for the centuries-old disgraceful plight of the poor African masses must not be allowed to be sustained by nice-sounding and clever business lingo any longer. I thank you all. <laughs>